And so I'd like to invite Joe Dubra to give us an update on the situation in Syria uh, and some of the media lies that have been going on there and the heroic resistance uh, of the Syrian people to imperialism. Comrade, can I ask? I was asked to explain, and given the context that this meeting is honoring the 200th anniversary of, anniversary of Marx's birth, explain why it is that Marxists give support to the bourgeois government of Bashar al-Assad. And it's one of the ways in which um, our anti-imperialist struggle is constantly attacked from the left in an imperialist country. Um, and it's something we see again and again and again and again. And when you start to get a bit old, as I, as I feel I'm starting to do, it gets pretty old, actually. You're like, God, this is like, it's, this is nothing original about any of the arguments you hear. They've been going around and around and around forever. But of course, when people come new to the movement and new to the struggle, the f it's the first time they've heard them. And it's confusing. Um, so I'll just, you know, bring us back to, to why we're here. 200 years ago in Trier in Germany, Karl Marx was born. And it's, it's something so important for us because... Although as Marxists, we know that the times make the man. It's not the man that makes the times. It's not, Marx couldn't have been born 200 years earlier and been Marx. He was a product of his time, but my God, what a product. You know, what an astounding contribution for one individual to make, you know. Um, he applied the dialectical method to the understanding of human history to understanding class society, to understanding political economy. He put our struggle, he put the class struggle on a scientific footing. And in doing so, he gave the working class, he gave us the tools for our liberation. It So Marx transformed socialism from being a utopian idea, a nice idea of a few concerned members of the bourgeoisie who didn't quite like the way the system was treating workers and thought they ought to rearrange things to be nicer and fairer. And there's still a million people hanging around trying to, trying to dream up ways to make a fairer world. But he, he relegated that really to a position of, of something rather childish. And um, I hope my daughter will forgive me, she's not here. So if, I'm, if I'm lucky, she won't watch the video. Um, it's something that she engages in now. She's 10. And she engages in fantasizing about how she would organize the world to make it nicer and fairer and how she would run a city. And, you know, she likes to come and tell me little ideas she's had. Oh, I'd do, I'd do it this way, Mum. I'd have it this way. You know, I'd make sure everybody had such and such. I'd make sure the houses were this kind of size. And this is, you know... But it's kind of a fantasizing rearranging of things because you see the world is unfair, but you don't really know the root of the unfairness yet. You haven't understood what's at the root of it. And so you just busy yourself with trying to make up systems that will do away with the unfairness that you see. But Marx, by revealing the laws of development of society, the laws of development of the economy, was able to show scientifically where our salvation will come from. Not from God, not from a nice capitalist, not from asking nicely, not from abolishing, abolishing unfairness, because it isn't very nice, but actually through what Ranjit referred to earlier, the growing force and organisation of the proletariat, the class which capitalism has produced but cannot satisfy, the class which is destined to become the gravedigger of the old system and the builder of the new. But of course, in doing so, Marx created certain, or showed us that there are certain preconditions to our liberation. He made socialism a science. And as Engels pointed out, when socialism has become a science, it must be studied. That is why our party puts such a premium on theory, on study, on education, why we say you cannot go and be an activist amongst the working class until you know something. We don't want to let loose charlatans and ignoramuses upon the working class. They're saturated with people like that already. 
The job of communists is to educate themselves so they're in a position to educate others. You can't tell somebody something if you don't know it yourself. You know, it's a kind of insane arrogance that we walk around thinking we can pronounce on things that we haven't actually thought about, studied, or know anything in any detail. So um, there's a beautiful quote which our party um, chair, Comrade Hapal, likes to um, recite and which I'm going to read to you also because it really sums up something very important. And Marx wrote it in the preface to the French edition of Capital in 1872. And he said, there is no royal road to science. And only those who do not dread the fatiguing climbs of its steep paths have a chance of gaining its luminous summits. And you can sum it up in another way. In another way, which is maybe more pithy, a little bit less poetic, more pithy, more known to people, which is knowledge is power. Knowledge is power, comrades, but knowledge doesn't come to you like that. It doesn't just fall off the tree. It doesn't come without effort. Knowledge requires consistent, persistent application. It requires you to spend time. It requires you to give up your ego and your prejudices and your preconceptions and come with an open mind in search of the truth because it's the truth that's going to set us free. And that's absolutely true. <laughs> that's true. And it's that combination of scientific theory with a disciplined mass organization which will give the working class the power to liberate itself. So, and of course, as Marxists living in the 21st century, we cannot ignore the contribution that Vladimir Ilyich Lenin made to the science of socialism, the science of Marxism. There's a reason we call ourselves Marxist-Leninists. It's not because we're like fans of the Russian Revolution. It's because Lenin did the incredibly important work of, while basing himself completely in the works of the founders of scientific socialism, in the works of Marx and Engels, he developed that science to take into consideration the further development of the capitalist system. And he showed us what imperialism is. He laid bare its workings in the same way that Marx had laid bare the workings of capitalism. He completely based himself in their writings. He didn't make something up out of the sky. He applied Marxism to this new era. He showed how it is the final era, the era of decaying capitalism, but also that in its decay, capitalism was creating and accelerating the seeds of revolution. So that is why he characterized imperialism as not only the era of decay in capitalism, but the era of socialist revolution. And that's the era we've been in since uh, imperialism came on the scene, and especially since 1917, of which we celebrated the anniversary, la the, the centenary last year, since October, since the Great October Revolution in Russia that founded the USSR, the world's first socialist state, we have been in the era of proletarian revolution. <laughs> so Lenin showed how imperialism worked. He showed that it ca it's characterized by this um, concentration of capital in the hands of a financial oligarchy. The big banks run the world. Well, you know, if you read imperialism and you look at the world today, you see nothing has changed at all. He was writing of exactly the conditions we're living in now. He showed how the system is characterized by um, a few powerful countries having emerged which have really controlled the rest of the world between them. At the time he was writing, they physically controlled it with um, colonial conquest. Today, since October, since the era of national liberation also came about following um, the October Revolution, many countries liberated themselves from direct control. But the quest to recolonize in various ways, whether it's direct recolonization, which we've seen a lot of since the collapse of the Soviet Union, or where it's indirect, you know, financial, what we call neo-colonialism, controlling via financial uh, instruments of the, the market and the means of production and all of that. Um, we still see the same position where a handful of super rich countries are really sucking the wealth of the world into uh, themselves and, and depriving, super exploiting the workers everywhere and depriving those 
the people in those countries of their own wealth and of the product of their labor. And he showed how there's a competition between the imperialist powers for control of the markets, the resources, the raw materials of the world, and how capitalist crisis deepens to an ever greater extent in the conditions of imperialism. Most importantly, in the connection with the, the topic I've been asked to speak to you about tonight, is the fact that Lenin showed irrefutably that the workers' struggle for social emancipation in the imperialist countries is intimately connected with the oppressed people's struggle for liberation. Now, one of the things that makes our party so different from ev every other party that calls itself socialist or communist in Britain is that we hold this as such a firm and dear principle, such a foundational part of what we're about because we know there is no revolution without the full support for uh, the national liberation movements, without understanding that we and they are fighting two fronts of the same battle. That's why, that's why we have the quotes we have of Lenin on the wall in this room. There's two quotes of Lenin's on the wall in here. Both of them are quotes which refer to the importance of upholding, supporting the national liberation struggles of the oppressed peoples all over the world. And it's not an accident that they're the quotes of Lenin's we've chosen. It's, it's so fundamental when you live in an imperialist country to recognize the importance of that for our struggle here. And Lenin didn't pluck that out of the air. You know, Marx, uh, already in the 19th century, pointed out how cooperating in the suppression of the Irish was keeping British workers tied to their exploiters' apron strings. It was preventing them from acting as an independent force to rise up and get rid of capitalism. Essentially, they were becoming stupid tools of their own oppression. And the same is true of workers in imperialist countries today. When we allow our ruling class to oppress nations, countries abroad, we are letting them become stronger. And their strength stops us from being able to organize against them. What we want is the defeat of our ruling class. We want our ruling class to be weaker. Anyone who is fighting our ruling class is fighting for us. And that's what, that's what Lenin taught us to understand, that in the era of imperialism, there are two fronts on the struggle for socialism. And one is the struggle of the oppressed people for national liberation against the same imperialists who at home are exploiting workers and keeping them poor and divided. And he taught us that everything that weakens imperialism strengthens the struggle for socialism. And, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, Marxism, hmm, it's a nice idea in theory. It'll never work in practice. Oh, well, they tried it in Russia, it all went wrong. You know, because people repeat things endlessly, because we are surrounded by a bourgeois media machine that's owned, run, uh, and filled by a hostile class, because they repeat these things endlessly, it doesn't make them true. Marxist-Leninist theory has been tested in the crucible of class struggle, in the crucible of history. And what do we see when Marxism-Leninism is combined with disciplined mass organization? There is nothing that can stop it. The most incredible feats of human history, the most incredible feats of the working class and of humanity have been achieved when Marxism-Leninism was connected with the masses. That is the power of this theory. Now, it's our great, great misfortune to live at a time when we've seen the collapse of the Soviet Union. We've seen re terrible reverses to our movement. 
And the collapse of the Soviet Union was preceded by three decades of revisionism when Marxist-Leninist theory was slowly discarded and falsified. And so this has led to disintegration and demoralization in the world communist movement. It led to a situation where the working class retreated, and not an orderly retreat, but a disorderly retreat. You know, our movement seemed to really crumble and fall apart. And all over the world, big communist parties cast aside the one weapon they have that guarantees their success, which is Marxist-Leninist theory. Um, and as a result, they also lost much of their organization. You know, in fact, the two things go together. It's the theory that gives us the power, the strength to organize, because it gives power to our elbow. It's the truth. When you take the truth to people, they can recognize it. If you're not ashamed to tell people the truth, you can have some impact on, their, on them, and the more conscious ones will come towards you. And the more you can attract the best and the brightest of the working class, the more chance you have of influencing the working class. It's not surprising that even quite small communist parties can have a big influence influence on the working class because the best, the brightest, the most conscious elements are attracted to Marxism precisely because it's the truth, precisely because it tells us exactly how things are, exactly why the working class does have a future, why, the, why this system has no future, why socialism will and can be built, how we're going to build it, how we can organize for it, gives us hope. You can't be a communist, you can't be a Marxist and be a pessimist. You know, they're mutually exclusive, as we were talking about earlier, Deborah. They're mutually exclusive. And it's not a blind optimism. It's based on facts, on science, on proper understanding of, of the system and the situation. And therefore, it's an incredibly powerful and motivating tool. And having this powerful and motivating tool enables us to take a historical perspective and say, well, all right, it's a shitty time to have to live through as a communist, to see the world, you know, I started to become conscious as a communist just as the Soviet Union was collapsing. You know, lucky for some of you guys who are coming into the movement now that actually the world's starting to turn around. The corner is being turned, the, you know, the, that triumphalism, as Ranjit referred to earlier, of the bourgeoisie in those days was actually pretty short-lived. They got a massive shot in the arm, but it didn't ultimately... Uh, you know, there was looting of, of the Soviet Union's wealth and resources. There was a jamboree for the imperialists who, actually their system had been looking pretty dicey in the end of the 80s. A oh, big sigh of relief all round, communists are out the, out the window, we, you know, we've won the day, and we can go ahead and, and loot the resources and exploit the people of the Soviet Union. And there was a kind of temporary, seemed like a temporary stabilization, but in fact, if you look 20, 25 years later, the world is less stable than ever. The system, after that, it's consumed that shot in the arm pretty darn quickly. And the other side, the crisis is deeper than it's ever been. We are now witnessing capitalism's deepest ever crisis of overproduction. So well, what does it mean for us today, this situation? It means that because of this situation of the temporary reverses, because of the theoretical conf confusion, all kinds of bourgeois ideology has flourished and found its way into our movement. Um, and it, of course, that includes bourgeois ideology that dresses itself up in revolutionary clothes. And I'm thinking particularly um, of Trotskyism. But you know, all the variants of social democracy have come in, wormed their way in, and given socialism a really bad name in the working class. Because what kind of advocate of the working class, after everything we've seen from all the Labour and Tory governments and how they're all essentially the same, and every worker who lives you know, and breathes the air in Britain today knows that you won't get anything better out of a Labour council than a Tory council, a Labour government than a Tory government. You won't get less war, you won't get less austerity, you won't get less anything, you won't get more of anything that you want, right? That the people who call themselves socialist and communist, who've dressed themselves up in the clothing and stolen a few of the phrases of Marxism, but denuded, as Ranjit was talking earlier, denuded it of its real revolutionary content, ripped out 
the heart from it, distorted it to such an extent it doesn't, it's no longer recognizable. They go to the workers and tell them, your salvation is the Labour Party. Well, for God's sake, no wonder, no wonder the working class hasn't got much truck with socialists, socialists and communists after decades of hearing this nonsense while they watch their lives being flushed down the toilet. And so I finally get to my point. We're in a situation that is characterized by confusion. And therefore, and with agents in our movement who spread poison uh, and just sow, sow confusion, distort Marxism, distort all the teachings of socialist science to the point that honest, genuine people are genuinely confused about the situation in Syria and who they should be supporting. Now, as a Marxist, it seems, it seems amazing to me that there could be any confusing, confusion. But there is, because of the action of all the forces that I've, that I've talked about already. Um, so when you, on top of all the blatant lies of the ruling class media, and it must be said that, particularly because of the staunch resistance of the Syrian people themselves over so many years, as their resistance continues to grow and as the Syrian people win victory after victory against uh, the invading hordes that have been sent against them, the lies of the imperialist media are being exposed and workers are more and more skeptical of what they read in the ruling class media. But of course, added to the lies of the ruling class media are the subtler lies of the trots, the revisionists, um, who say things like, well, you can't support the government of Bashar al-Assad because he's not a socialist. I.e., if you're on the side of the workers, you must only support a government that proclaims itself to be also a workers' government. Or they'll say, well, we can't really get involved with what's going on in Syria because actually it's a great power struggle. It's not our business. It's between a bunch of rich people and another bunch of rich people and, you know, we don't care about that. They say, oh, it's all part of the plan of Russian imperialism, which is so aggressive. But if we apply theory, Marxist theory, to the question, it becomes actually staggeringly simple. What weakens imperialism? Stalin in 1924, when he wrote Foundations of Leninism, gave two really very pertinent examples. And once you've understood the essence of what he's talking about there, all of these questions become exceptionally simple to solve. He talked about the Emir of Afghanistan. He said, this guy is a feudal autocrat, but in leading his people to kick imperialism out of Afghanistan, objectively, he is strengthening the struggle for socialism in the world, the global struggle to weaken imperialism. He is part of that broad world front and should be supported on that basis. He talked about the Egyptian bourgeois nationalist struggle at the same time. And remember at this moment, there was a Labour government in Britain that was trying to suppress that struggle in the name of the workers. And he said, on one side, you have bourgeois nationalists in Egypt who are fighting against British, British rule in their country. Uh, they are anti-worker. They don't want a worker state. They want a bourgeois state. In Britain, you have a Labour government trying to maintain its control of Egypt, run by a party of people who, many of them have proletarian origins and proclaim themselves to be for the workers. He said, but the fact is, they are fighting to maintain imperialist control of Egypt. The Egyptian bourgeois nationalists are fighting against imperialist control of their country. It's the Egyptian bourgeois nationalists with whom we must side. It's their struggle which weakens imperialism. So, so ultimately we ask ourselves, who fights against or for imperialism? How do we characterize the sides in the war? Who is fighting whom? 
Who benefits? Who, who are the sides in Syria? On one side, we have an invading horde of jihadis who seemed to pop up out of nowhere and were immediately branded by our media as the opposition, as rebels. But the more that time goes on, the more that we've understood about these people, the clearer it is that they are um, made up in the vast majority of foreign fighters, not native Syrians, that they have been trained, armed, funded, logistically supported and backed in every way possible, including with propaganda and diplomacy, by US, British, French imperialism, by NATO, and by their regional proxies, by Turkey, by Israel, by Saudi Arabia. And who are they fighting? The Syrian forces, the patriotic forces of the Syrian Arab army, the Syrian National Defense Forces, and some of their allies who have come to them, invited in their hour of need to help to defend the Syrian people from this invasion. Iran, Hezbollah, and now Russia. Every one of the forces fighting against the jihadi invasion in Syria, in one way or another, is an obstacle to imperialist control and domination of the world. <laughs> who benefits if Syria loses? I'll tell you who doesn't benefit, British working people. Who benefits? Who benefits if an independent state in the Middle East is destroyed? Number one, the US gets to put some army bases down next to Iran. As we know, Iran, Hezbollah, Syria constitute, and the Palestinian struggle constitute an axis of resistance to imperialist control of the Middle East. As far as the imperialists are concerned, Syria is a stepping stone to Iran. It's become a stumbling block. It was supposed to be a stepping stone. They're not achieving their aims and they're so angry about it. They're absolutely livid and you can see that in the reaction they're having in the media to those people, those few honest investigative reporters who are prepared to tell the truth about what's really happening in Syria. The absolute hysterical rage and bile which is poured on them by the imperialist media shows how how angry are the imperialists and how impotent actually that they are not able, have not been able to get their way despite inflicting a war which even the Today program is bemoaning. Oh my gosh, it's gone on longer than the Second World War, they say. And then of course they say, and it shows no signs of ending. Well, actually it does show every sign of ending. The problem is it's not ending in the way that the imperialists planned and so they're doing everything they can to prolong it. Who benefits if Syria wins? The people of the Middle East. Everybody in the world who wants to believe that they can win against imperialism benefits if Syria wins. The British working class definitely benefits if Syria wins. So, I better wrap up. For all the reasons stated above, I think it's clear that British workers have a real interest in the outcome of the war in Syria. It's not an abstract question for us, it's not a humanitarian question, it's not a kind of, oh, I wonder, debating point. We have a real interest in the weakening and defeat of our own ruling class because that ruling class is our enemy. <laughs> and that is why comrades, our party puts front and centre of its policy uh, the quotes of Lenin that I talked about earlier, the understanding that support for the national liberation struggle is an absolute central plank of everything that we do. That is why we do all in our power to expose the lie machine that paves the way for the war machine. That is why we say the precondition 
for building a real anti-war movement that has anti-imperialism at its heart is a mass campaign of non-cooperation and a mass campaign of non-cooperation with the war can only be built if we have first created an understanding amongst working people that they are being lied to. So exposing the lie machine is the first step in building that anti-war movement that will put non-cooperation non and sabotage of the war effort at its heart. Okay. And so, comrades, in conclusion, that is why our party has always upheld and will continue to uphold the right and the duty of the people of the oppressed world to resist imperialism, the right and the duty of the people in the imperialist countries to support them, and why when it comes to uh, the struggle against imperialist war, we have two slogans that we stand by and do everything in our power to popularize and bring to the working class, which is no cooperation with imperialist war and victory to the resistance. We thank him for coming. I'm sure he wasn't put off by Jyoti. In fact, I think Jyoti's speech was fantastic, very rousing. Thank you, Jyoti. Uh, and an excellent uh, exposition of why only those who are really Marxist can really be anti-imperialist, can really understand that the interests of the working class here is intimately linked by a thousand threads to the interests of the expressed and exploited peoples across the globe. Is a wonderful speech. Thank you, Jyoti. Um, you know, we live in interesting times, don't we? Don't we? <laughs> uh, not only is you know, the Syrian conflict proving to be almost like a Stalingrad, a turning point in the balance of forces of the post-Soviet era, when imperialism really faces defeat, when imperialism can launch its full... First of all, Trump is a character, isn't he? I mean, uh, re recently we found out that he's going to uh, be visiting Britain after all in July. July the 13th, is it? I know already the trots are very excited about it. I'm sure there's going to be a very, very big demonstration against him. And, I, and we're totally happy with that. We're always happy to demonstrate against US imperialism. But what we object to is that they don't really demonstrate against US imperialism. They demonstrate against Trump as an individual, as an identity, you know? Trump, they say, is specifically horrible and Nazi. Now, of course, Trump is a redneck. Of course, Trump is a racist. We wouldn't expect anything else from the leader of the world's most aggressive and rapacious imperialist system. But where was their righteous anger and indignation against Obama? Obama. <laughs> you know, when, when Obama came, they didn't stage huge demonstrations demanding that he left. They fated him. They spoke of Brother Obama. Yeah, Brother Obama is coming to see us. But even John Pilger was able to point out, after a short period, maybe even after about six or seven years of Obama's rule, the kind of point hit home, didn't it? That Obama also liked to execute people extrajudicially in countries outside the territorial uh, 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 realm of jurisdiction of the United States of America. Isn't this an aggressive and brutal act? Obama did his killing, I'm told, mostly on a Thursday when he signed his extrajudicial warrants for drone strikes and killed thousands and tens of thousands of people in that way. Obama carried on the wars uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Obama carried on and initiated the war against Syria. In fact, when Trump came to power, the very ironic thing is that we get these far-right people who sometimes express an interest which is more to the left of the, of the apparently left. He came to power demanding that imperialism, because he didn't call it imperialism, I don't think he understands the concept of imperialism, I think that's his kind of weakness, he doesn't really understand what, how the American system needs global domination, needs its military intervention, and intervention. There's not some kind of charitable act when they go and overturn governments, they do it to guarantee the right of their, uh, their capital to penetrate those markets, you know, uh, uh, McDonald's, 
needs the hand of the McDonnell Douglas. You know, they need their military to clear the way for their goods, for their cultural and their economic imperialism. That's how the system works. I actually think Trump doesn't understand that. He's not the brightest chap, is he? I actually think that, you know, he thought to make America great again, you had to pull America back, not spend so much on the military. But then at the same time, tweets in a contradictory fashion, we're going to spend more than ever on the military. So it's really confused. You can't tell from one moment to the next whether he's going to unleash fire and fury on Korea or in fact say, no, no, Kim Jong-un's a really good chap and we'll sit down and have a burger together. Uh, so it's like com comedic to watch it unfold. But what it's a sign of, I think Trump is a sign of the deep discontent even within the heartland of imperialism. They voted him against the real will of imperialism to have uh, you know, a smooth and corporate spokesperson who will quietly and efficiently go about do the business of regime change and war and, you know, inflicting misery upon the peoples of the earth. Because when we talk about the statistics that there are eight people who have as much wealth as half the world's population, that doesn't happen by accident. It's not that, you know, that's the natural economic order, that's the natural outcome of laissez-faire economics. It's not. That is, you know, wealth moving uphill so steeply against the natural gravitational flow that would let it actually flow into the, in, into the pockets of the people who make it and control it. And it's only able to keep on doing that precisely because of this huge, grotesque, parasitic, parasitic military excres excrescence that the United States and their system of world imperialism is. And this brutal military dictatorship in which they beat down any independent nation and state, in which they subvert and cow the workers within their own systems. I and mean, if you see the demonstrations, I often think of it um, at, at, uh, at Little Rock, at um, Don't Shoot. Was that demonstration? Ferguson, Missouri. If you see those demonstrations, it's like seeing their military in Iraq, isn't it? I mean, their, pol their domestic police are armed to the teeth in just the same way as their actual overseas world policemen, their military. And this is the state that US imperialism imposes on the world. But it's with great you know, hope that I see that imperialism really does lift rocks to drop it on its own feet. Maybe at the moment, you know, the, the really principled thinking Marxist analysis is not there at the head of every liberation struggle, but it's amazing how the world can't be turned back before the experience of the October Revolution. The world can't be turned back before the experience of the anti-colonial movements for national liberation. How people continue to struggle with whatever tools come to hand and do so remarkably effective against the monster that is US imperialism. It's lovely to see then not only the progress being made by the Syrian people to rid themselves of the United States, and despite fully one third of their country being occupied, they're managing to do it. It's lovely to see the Cuban revolution going from strength to strength. It's lovely to see progress and stability being maintained at Venezuela in the face of great odds. But it's lovely to see what's happening in, in the Korean peninsula. We asked the comrades from the, from, the, from the Korean embassy to come, and Comrade Kim very much wanted to be with us, but as you'll understand, they have a lot on their plate at the moment. Um, it was a fantastic announcement. Um, since really the Olympics, when Kim Jong-un has successfully through his strategy for advancing the much cherished and long held ambition of the Korean people for reunification, he's advanced a fantastic diplomatic offensive where, you know, the, in, in the Winter Olympics in, in, uh, in Pyeongchang, the two North and South teams competed together, and you will have seen some of the footage, and you see how very powerful that was, how clearly it exposed the sentiment of both people, both North and South, to get rid of their division, which of course was imposed by the United States on the Korean Peninsula as part of the Cold War at the end of the Second World War. And both people, both North and South, but particularly the North, have desperately wanted the reunification of their country. And I think they've taken some really fantastic concrete steps towards that with the, with the summit, with the meeting of, uh, of uh, the premiers of North and South Korea. Uh, uh, Kim Jong-un, of course, and uh, Moon Jae-in, Jae that's right, of course.
so I, I hope you'll, uh, with me, send our, our greetings uh, to the people of Korea, North and South, to our comrades at the embassy, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and the leadership uh, of the Workers' Party of Korea on the great steps and advances they're making uh, towards reunification in the teeth of the hostile opposition of the United States, who of course would like to keep it divided, to keep their territorial bases in the South, their nuclear weapons in the South, their cruise, their cruise missiles in the South, their huge numbers of Air Force bases and naval bases in the South, with which they use again as part of their strategy to encircle Russia, encircle China, militarize the South uh, uh, East China Sea, South China Sea, uh, and force their domination on the world. But really their grip is loosening and crumbling, and we salute this advance of diplomacy for the Korean people. So join me please in <laughs> greeting that achievement. <laughs>